Hi, I'm Sean Emerson, and welcome to Men Living's The Big Question. At Men Living, we're continually looking for ways to create spaces that can lead to more connection, growth, and harmony. With that mission in mind, we will assemble a diverse group of individuals in a virtual space to explore a societal big question once every month. Our intention is to offer perspective from different angles, promoting more curiosity and understanding. In this, our fourth episode, we discuss bullying. Our panelists are Andre Bowie, Sarah Bess Warren, Jenny Kopak, and Jason Smatis. We cover the origins of bullying, actions of adults versus children, impact on community and civility, and our panelists get pretty vulnerable talking about some of their own personal experiences. I hope you enjoy June's The Big Question. Question. Um, so let me start out. I, uh, myself and Chris Lozier interviewed Christine Porath, who's a professor at Georgetown, um, on Monday. And uh, she's a, a professor at the business school. And she wrote two books, one, Mastering Community and Mastering Civility. And uh, it occurred to me in reading Master of Civility that we're not very civil these days. Um, and, and to take it a step further, that a lot of what might be happening um, in our culture, in our society, is due to the fact that not only we're we not civil, but we're just mean to each other, um, that we bully each other. And there's been a lot of discussion about bullying as a significant reason for some of the mental health issues in our country. And so we're bringing it to the table for the big question today. And so maybe just to start, um, you know, opening feelings about bullying, experiences, definitions. I mean, when I use that word, what does it mean to you? And anyone can go. I'll, I'll start. I'll be, I'll be quick. It's very triggering for me. Um, mostly because of, of childhood and my experience with, I have a number of distinct experiences that I remember back in elementary school and junior high where I was bullied. And I have a number of traumatic experiences where I condoned bullying, not because I was the one doing the bullying per se, but I watched it. I participated in and I did, well, I didn't participate, but I silently participated and I didn't do anything to stop it. Um, and I saw that happen as a child. Um, I actually experienced that quite a bit in, in, in a family realm. Cause then I went into a family business where there was a tremendous amount of belittling and bullying, um, and the same type of behavior, you know, I would, condone the actions when it was being done by somebody else and had a lot of it done to me so um so yeah I mean so I'll just start with my opening in that I, it's it's a triggering um subject matter for me and I'm glad we're having this discussion tonight so so let me just throw this in the mix and people can respond to this as they go and Jason you may want to respond now and so in with your experiences why do you think people bully um I mean, there's a lot of reasons in, in my experience, um, you know, it, it, going back to the childhood experiences, I think it's just um, want, you know, certain kids, whether because they're bigger, stronger, smarter, more popular, want to exert that power. And it's so easy to pick on others who are clearly weaker or not as smart or not as cool. I put in quotes there. Um, so I, I think that, you know, in, again, in my experience, it was done, the bullying was done by a group, a, a person or a group of people that had, I don't like to use the word power, because we're talking about, you know, sixth graders or eighth graders, but you know what I'm saying, like, social power, mm -hmm. I, I'll call it, you know, and, and it was just easy to pick on and, and in order to, I guess, continue to carry your 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 popularity card in these social settings you had to exert that coolness that power and subject other people to the bullying it, was it any different 
those reasons any different in as you became an adult in the business situation, family business situation you were in? No, believe it or not, no, no. It, and mm -hmm. it's it's hard it's hard to imagine. Maybe it's not hard to imagine. I shouldn't say that, but that family members would bully other family members. But it was brutal. It was intense, um, and it was again. I think it was done by older generation members of mine to to me and members of my generation to exert power, to exert influence. Now, I will say there was there was a there there was a shred of of decency in there because I know the other this is this is the way the older generation communicated, and it was their way to motivate us, to energize us. To get our to get us to improve our performance in a business setting, unfortunately, the methods were toxic and incredibly destructive. Yeah, I'll I'll step in with Jason um, because just because I, I I would say that I had a similar uh, orientation, you know, I, um, as a as a youth, you know, I would. I was I would say that I was probably bullied on a consistent level and that had a profound impact on my emotional state. Um, quite frankly, it was something that I took personal like, well, you're picking on me and not this person. So there must be something about me that makes all these people target me in a public setting. Um, and so, so I had that orientation. And then I also had the orientation of being an educator. Um, so, and as I was telling um, Jenny earlier, you know, I grew up in Detroit and then now I'm an educator outside of uh, Chicago, Illinois. And I spent the first 10 years of my career heavily involved with teenagers that are in conflict with each other. Um, and a lot of those circumstances revolved around one person attacking or bullying another person, um, which which gravitated onto social media, because now we live in an age of social media. So it makes it that much easier to attack people over a screen versus face to face, which I experienced the face to face interaction. And now students are experiencing the face to face interaction uh, and the, 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 the screen interaction. And so I kind of have a because of that experience that I had as a younger person and my experience that I had as an educator working with students, I kind of have this controversial view of how to approach bullying. I think a lot of times people outside of the school realm would like me as an educator to stop bullying. Um, but I think it's very difficult for an educator to do that because a, a bully normally targets you when you're at your weakest. And when you as an individual go for help for somebody to stop that, the targeting gets even, it gets ramped up. And I've seen that happen to numerous of students who have reached out for help and then other students find that out or that student finds it out. And then they, they like, oh, well, you're snitching on me. So then they kind of ramp, ramp that up. Uh, one thing that I've, I've found that has been helpful for the kids that I work with that are the targets is helping them navigate that situation and um, kind of socially and psychologically protect themselves. And I think as I look back at it, I wish I had more people in my life that were able to help me psychologically defend myself and protect myself whereas i i thought that i wanted somebody to stop it for me but really what i needed was a, a, the ability to psychologically protect myself from the attacks that were coming up um and so i i talked to other educators a lot of them female um, they they disagree with that. They well, you know, you need to find a way to stop this. You need to find a way to address this, and more programs and things of that nature. I just haven't found that to be the case that actually works because a bully again targets you when you're weak. They they go between the channels to try to get to you. They don't necessarily do it in a public setting. Um, and so I found that helping students actually address it kind of kind of helps them.
Well, that's so cool. I'm I'm so glad to hear both of you guys kind of talk about your experiences and I'll I'll put mine through the lens of um, what I do, which is, you know, working again with schools, but we set, you know, behavior governing guidelines for the participants of our competition. And they are, you know, school students, teachers, parents, and then volunteers and administrators. And bullying and misbehavior is, is a huge part of of any sort of ex experience, just like, you know, little league, you've got coaches, you've got volunteers, you've got parents, whether it's a sport or an academic competition, there is a lot of pressure um, around making sure that the kids are protected, that the kids are safe, and that the experience is really positive. So I, um, like you said, Sean, this year, and the year before, I think um, the pandemic has changed a little bit of our social contract and that people have broken the contract. And for some reason, it seems like um, all hell has broken loose. And there is a little bit of a license to forget about um, how to express yourself in front of a student, how to control um, your anger, how to model best practice um, you know, interactions. And so that's something that we work on a ton. We try to model teamwork, sportsmanship, um, you know, and, and collaboration for students. We try to model for parents that they should allow their students to do those things without their help. Um, and we want to make sure that volunteers don't overstep um, in terms of how they interact with students, that they're always on their best behavior. And that um, when there is behavior that gets out of line, we want to make sure that people know we take it seriously and that there are consequences. So that's something that I feel really comfortable calling out. And I've been a little bit of a mama bear when it comes to it um, across the country. Um, and, and maybe it is, maybe it is the, the parent in me. I just will not allow um, any bullying or any misbehavior in our program at any level. And I'll call it out and I'll take the heat and I'll make sure that uh, if you're the one doing it, that you face a consequence because we just cannot continue to look the other way. This is uh, a serious part of our, our mental health landscape. So, um, so just as a reminder, Jenny runs uh, the Science Olympiad. And, and Jenny, how many, how many volunteers and how many students would participate in uh, annually, let's say? There's a quarter million students. Right. And for every one of the 425 tournaments we have, there are 300 volunteers. So it's it's a massive organization. Um, people volunteer, you know, hundreds of hours of their time. And, you know, since it is competitive, people do get heated. Um, but just like we expect, you know, kids to follow rules, we expect parents to follow rules too. And there are um, there are levels of learning. It's not just an immediate, you know, you're out. We want to be able to explain to people um, how they can better handle situations. And so we're trying to, we're trying to educate people more about that, which is something I think when this organization started, you know, 38 years ago, it wasn't part of the conversation, but now I think it has to be. And I'm actually really proud that our organization spends time talking about it. I think it's really important. So, so what, what occurs to me is I was talking with Andre earlier and we were talking about basketball and, you know, there's a lot of trash talking in basketball. So we could talk about trash talking versus bullying. And so in the science Olympiad, you know, is there, is there trash talking? Do you consider that bullying? Is it out of bounds? And then the other question I have for you are, would you say the, the adults versus children, where do most of the problems lie? I would say the kids are actually uh, behaving themselves a lot better than the adults. So I think we've all seen evidence on TV of parents getting dragged, you know, off the field or arrested at little league games. And we haven't had that happen yet. Um, but I say yet, because who knows? Um, yeah. It's really, it's probably more adults not being able to accept um, outcomes of situations and being frustrated. And so that is really, that's the, that's the unfortunate part of it. I think the kids to each other, sure, they're very competitive, but there's so much sportsmanship. We have so many 
sister school um, mentoring, you know, co-mentoring experiences where uh, a high school will mentor a middle school and the kids are working with each other in the district, outside the district, people that they're competing against, they're working together. The kids are incredible. The social fabric that they build through communities like Science Olympiad and other activities, it actually prevents bullying because people have a safe space to be themselves and then they go to a competition, whether it's chess or whether it's, you know, badminton or football. And there's more people who like chess, badminton and football. So it's a safe space. The kids are great. It really is. Um, it's the adults. And so we've mm -hmm. had to issue some additional guidelines for adult behavior. And uh, especially when it comes to um, how you act around kids, it's even more important. So it's usually the adults. I, I mean, I, I'm kind of speechless because it, we, we, talk a lot about the fact that as adults, you know, we can tell kids things all day, but what it comes down to it is what do we model? What yeah. do they see? Yep. And so, you know, if we, as adults, we're here, five adults here talking about bullying. And, and I think from the perspective of, would like to have, um, you know, some solutions to it. If, if a bunch of adults are, are acting like asses, what, I mean, <laughs> What do we expect the kids to do? Yeah, but I mean, the kids actually, I think sometimes they um, they will be the ones to call it out or they'll be the ones to almost embarrass you in the reflection of how mm. they act. So the kids mm. really, the kids are so impressive and they're so, they have such great spirit and so much community spirit um, to embrace each other that, uh, that yeah, it's, it's more the competitive, I think the competitive parents and that gets to the whole, um, just the whole argument about how we can do better um, educating our, our parents about the role that they play um, with their kids as it, as it relates to, you know, to academics and sports, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the coaching, you know, the coaching mindset. Yeah. SB. Yeah. I mean, so much has been said that I, that I've resonated so much with. And I, I think this is such a great topic because it clearly cuts across the personal, the professional in an interpersonal or small group sphere, like, you know, Andre was describing, and then this really wide scale uh, organizational culture piece that Jenny is bringing forward. Um, I, uh, I come to it uh, in uh, from many of those dimensions as well. Um, uh, having had, you know, who hasn't had personal experience with uh, with bullying? I think that's one of the most interesting things about this topic is everyone experiences themselves to be a target, and very few experience themselves to be bullies. Um, and I think the the uh, the few insights that that I have that are kind of big picture as we start the conversation is that for me, uh, bullying is about power and belonging, uh, which I think we've all named uh, in various ways. And Jenny, I think your example of the adults behaving badly is such a great example of the power dynamic at play within that organizational culture that they are the folks uh, with greater power um, and are wielding it <laughs> um, in unfortunate ways. And and um, what you describe of of students finding their their safe space, their space of belonging, um, I think is 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 the way that we all wish to feel um, in community and uh, both small and large, um, and that we wish our children to feel. And so I think the question is, how do we foster cultures of belonging? How do we foster spaces where power is uh, named and challenged when it challenged when it is wielded in um, unskillful, harmful ways? Um, and how do we also recognize that those who are causing harm um, also need to be brought into the community of belonging as well? Um, and that's the last thing that I'll that I'll name is that. Um, after uh, sitting in, in restorative circles with uh, those who consider themselves uh, harm doers or bullies and those who exper have experienced harm at, those, at their hands, um, what I know to be true is that uh, hurt people hurt people. Uh, and uh, that very rarely do bullies feel empowered um, as they seem or in control as they might appear. Um, and so I think that that this is this is the truth about about human nature that is a very common um, 
uh, saying in, in the restorative world, this idea that hurt people hurt people or harm that is not transformed is transferred. So uh, what is it that that needs to be worked through a, on an individual basis, on a cultural basis, on a societal basis in order to be transformed so that we don't keep perpetuating these cycles of harm? Um, yeah, so that's that's what I would offer as, as kind of my uh, my way into this topic. Thanks, Sean, for opening yeah. it up. Sorry, I think I was muted. Am I am I good now? Yes, you're good. All right. Um, can I echo echo some of those sentiments that SB brought up? I mean, I was I was just thinking the same thing. Like, um, I am no angel in the topic, and I've targeted people on several occasions as an adult and as a and, and as a adolescent. And I'm thinking back on the times where I was very deadly with my targets, and those were times in my life where I was at my most in my most pain you know mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that pain came from pain other people projected onto me and then not having a place to go with that pain projected it onto somebody else as a target so I, I think that that point that you bring up SB is very important uh and it, and it kind of and it allows me to have a lot of empathy for a lot of bullies because I know that behind all of bravado they're in pain with something and so and my my instinct is to attack you attack me I attack you back but now uh, I'm starting to learn that uh that person's in pain be careful you know what I'm saying so I'm glad you brought that up Andre uh, opening the door talking about you know you having some targets I'm curious about what what your bullying looked like I mean what what were the actions or the words that you were using as you considered yourself a bully so are we talking adolescent andre or wherever you want to go Where, it's well, both. Well, well i'll give you i'll give you both adolescent andre I, I i remember distinctively um going after these two boys that they were they were we so i lived in a predominantly black community um there was a small minority of uh jewish individuals that live within our community um and so these two boys who were jewish went to our school and i remember targeting those kids by essentially making them stand stand like near a wall and us as kids taking snow and throwing them at the kids and not just liking that, like I made one of the boys pull up his shirt in, in the winter and get hit by, to get hit by these snowballs. And I remember that to this day, that was over 20 years ago. And I think the reason why I remember that because that wasn't, that's not something that's in my nature, but I remember the pain that I was suffering at that particular point in my life that allowed me to stoop down to that at individual level so that's probably a, a huge example of what that looked like as an adolescent now as an adult i think it's a little bit more harder to see but still there um i can think of several times where someone would say something to me that would trigger something an emotional response to me and as an adult i'm able to cover that up a little bit better but um the response to that is always a retaliation like, okay, you, you've attacked me somehow. So now I have to make you look bad. So my, so my attack not as an adult was I'm going to make you look bad in front of people because you made me look bad in front of people. And that's a, that's a huge trigger for me. And so, um, I think my meditation has allowed me to see that more clearly and to just take a step back from that. Cause there's some, at the end of the day, there's something going on with me that's allowing me do that and that's what needs to be addressed not um what that person said to me to make me feel that way i think before i was i was more worried about well that person said something to me that triggered me and so that's why i attacked them and now the conversation is, is well why am i feeling this way um to have to go after that person and try to attack them
Does anybody have a re reaction, SB, I'm looking at you. Anybody have a reaction to either of those stories? I mean, I personally, I, I, I felt some real emotion um, on the first story. I don't know if anybody else did. And if you want to comment. Yeah, I, and I think I, you're, I mean, I know this about you, Andre, you're a very brave person. That's a very brave thing to say, the way in which we've harmed other people. Um, I, I facilitate an exercise uh, called harmed to me, harm to me and through me. And it, it calls on participants to say uh, when they have been caused harm, but when, when they've experienced harm from others and when, the, when they've caused harm to others. And people always find it much more difficult to see themselves in that role of harm doer. And so I think it's a brave thing to, to call that out. Um, I think if, if we can do that more and more, we'll stop um, uh, demonizing those who cause harm and realize that it is ourselves that we need to transform and also our own trauma. Uh, you know, you, you, you're talking about your mindfulness practice that you've used to transform that kind of, that pain that you experienced. You took accountability for that and, and are seeking to end that cycle. Then I think about those boys who experience that in their bodies and the way in which trauma is is held in the body um, and the way in which it, it manifests in unexpected ways across our lifetime. Uh, there's a, a well-known text called The Body Keeps the Score um, uh, by Bessel van der Kolk. And it's really, you know, it speaks to the way that um, that this trauma is trapped in us and it, it finds its way out and uh, often in very harmful and unskillful ways. And so, um, you know, you talked and you spoke in your invitation, Sean, about that, that kind of cycle as a society. How can we get out of this cycle? And I think it's what you described, Andre. It's self-awareness, uh, holding oneself accountable and then transforming that harm. So props to you. Uh, I want to add something to that. You know, I think when, when SB was talking earlier, she mentioned, you know, hurt people, hurting pe other people. And then um, this sense of belonging as two motivators for bullying. And, and Andre's example was obviously him talking about him where he was at. He was in a dark place. He was in a bad place, which is what drove his his bullying with those, with those Jewish kids in his school. I have an example of when... Um, Again, this was in my young adult, as, I, as a young adult in, in, a, in a business setting, in a family business setting, I acted in a bullying capacity in many ways, um, not because I was in a dark place, but as, as, as SB said, because the culture was built like that. And I wanted so much to prove that I could belong to this culture. That was really, really strong in my family business where you had to toe the line, you had to fit into the culture. And I was the firstborn of the next generation. So that was really important to me. And I acted in many ways, like, like my old, like the older generation did, because I thought, A, that's what they expected me to do. I was a pleaser and I wanted to please them. And I wanted to fit in. Mm -hmm. I wanted to belong. That was so important to me, not only in a business sense, but in a, it was a family business, but also in a family sense. My dad was there. I wanted to make my dad proud. I wanted to make my uncle proud. These were two very strong, intelligent, and narcissistic personalities that I was really trying to live up to. So, you know, to just follow up on a different example, like, like Andre said, my example is different, but the same outcome. I bullied other people. Um, non-family members and family members who were younger than me um, and, uh, you know, did the same thing to not only exert my power, my influence, but really to, to exert that sense of belonging and to show my superiors, hey, guys, I belong here. I fit in. And it was pretty pathetic. There seems to be a level of, of intensity that I'm, that I'm noticing in people's people's response to either frustration or failure, that the knee-jerk reaction 
is to to hurt or to to bully. And I think we're seeing that in all areas of our, our culture right now. And, you know, if anyone pays attention to looking at statistics about, you know, things like gun violence, you know, 98% of these um, experiences are committed by men. And then even, you know, in situations where we're dealing with power dynamics and adult volunteers, you know, so often these are experiences that are led by men. And it, I, I'm always just so struck by, um, I'm not sure what it, what it is and what we have not done as a society to help people understand the building blocks of venting from ex internal explosions. Like, I don't know if we have to just build a bunch of chimneys on people just to understand how to let that steam out and not just have it explode onto other people. Cause I mean, there's shrapnel all over the place and that's like not even a metaphor. That's a, a literal thing. So, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so interested if there's any, if there's any help or solutions or advice about what's happening. Um, I mean, of course it's, you know, not gender specific but there are, there are some, some things right now that are, that are very, you know, I think society linked culturally attached to, to men not being able to find those outlets um, or not knowing how to like talk themselves down from that ladder. Do you have yeah, a perspective? I'll you on that, Jenny. Uh, yeah, so let, we, we can go around the horn on why we think men are, now, mean girls aside, which we could talk about, but uh, yeah, why men, there. you know, it's there. disproportionately as it relates to your particular issue, um, and then maybe generally why men men might be the biggest perpetrators of this. Andre, were you going to- I feel gonna... like in the school, well, I feel like I, 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 I'm really feeling what Jenny said, just because um, at first I used to think that it was just like a, like a hormone thing or a testosterone thing, but I think it's much more to it than just the chemicals that's going through the body. And because I work in a high school, it's a very, it's a very if you want to learn about people, you work in a high school because you really get to see some interesting shit but yeah. it's like when I work and when I work with my sophomore girls I think that that is a and, and I'm generalizing here that is a mean bunch yeah. a group of individuals mm -hmm. sophomore girls not freshman girls not junior <laughs> girls but sophomore <laughs> teenage girls they are just they obliver they 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 they're they're crazy with each other. And something happens between that time and junior year where those girls figure out, you know what, this is bullshit. Like I can't continue to act like this. And so they change. And then you see the change immediately. The same girl that was attacking, you know, people on social media and doing all that stuff. The next year, they're doing the complete opposite, and they're learning from those mistakes. For, again, I'm generalizing. This is not every girl. This is a generalization. Now, guys, I think something else happens. Like, they go through the same process, but the realization doesn't click in that they need to behave differently. And so it, it doesn't manifest itself like the same way that girls do, but something happens to where that violence just comes out and other, it, it oozes out in different ways. Um, for example, playing basketball and you miss a shot and you call the person that misses a shot a bitch. You know what I'm saying? It just kind of oozes out in all these different nasty ways. And I don't know why the girls figure it out, but the guys don't. I'm thinking it's because of the support systems that girls surround themselves with versus the support systems that guys surround themselves with. And it's totally different. Like girls, I feel, learn how to support themselves a lot better, younger than guys do. But that's just my hypothesis. Jenny SB, do, you, do either one of you have a comment on that? So I am really, I like the stereotype police. <laughs> In my own life, people know this about me. I I cannot make a clip. I, I don't know that that's true, that men are more likely to bully uh, or people who identify as, as male. male. Um, 
But what I what I will come back to is the idea of power. And we know that patriarchy is one of the most entrenched systems of hierarchy that is pervasive. And so uh, those who have the opportunity to exercise power are more likely to do so in harmful ways because I think, as Jenny points out, we don't have these stopgap measures to contain that kind of um, uncontrolled or unfettered form of power. Um, so so that's that's what I would name about this gendered piece. Um, but I think something something you said, Andre, made me made me realize it. I think it's helpful also to name what we're talking about when we say bullying. I think there's a difference between being unkind and engaging in bullying acts. Um, uh, Adrian Marie Brown just wrote a beautiful pamphlet sized uh, hot pink book uh, called We Will Not Cancel Us. And in it, uh, Adrian Marie Brown describes different categories that we're often talking about when we talk about harm, broadly speaking. And um, so there's a difference between misunderstanding, conflict, um, what are some of the other categories? Um, unresolved, um, oh shoot, I wish I had it with me. I'm not gonna remember all of the categories fairly well, but then abuse as a separate category from kind of conflict and misunderstanding and others. And I would label bullying as a form of abuse. And that's kind of a different level than a misunderstanding or a conflict uh, between those whose power dynamic is, is fairly well on the same playing field. Um, so, so just, yeah, I wanted to name that as we, as we move forward, that we're talking about something a little bit more serious than, than a lack of kindness. And I think that what's sad about where we are at as a, as a society is, you know, as Jenny names is that we don't know how to live in a good way with each other. A lot of the, um, a lot of the ways of, uh, of ritualizing things like power and uh, uh, gender and formalized relationships are not a part of uh, contemporary society. Um, we are not led by wise elders. Um, we don't live in small uh, communities where people know each other really well and therefore understand the impact of their actions on all of those people. We live in a, in a more uh, anonymous um, uh, a culture with a lot of loose connections. And I think that that creates the, the causes and conditions um, to be uh, to be abusive to one another because we because we we are not sufficiently humanizing one another um, in this culture. So I know I said a lot. I'll stop there. <laughs> Choose your own adventure from that point. Well, um, can I respond to you, SB? Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go, ahead. go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you want to respond specifically? Go ahead, Andre. I'll talk after you. No, I just want to. I just want to. Just this is just the same thing. I'll, I'll be real quick. It kind of so you say that. What I'm hearing from you is you say that we kind of create these conditions that allow this type of behavior to kind of manifest itself. It's, like, it's almost like you're a farmer and if you create the right conditions then the flowers and everything will grow really good. If you create the, a, a bad condition, then you're not going to get as good as fruit is kind of what I'm hearing you say. Um, and, and, and one thing that like popped into my head as you were saying that is just this continuous need that we in this culture have kind of put out there as, as, as competition. Like we're all in competition with one another and that competition manifests itself everywhere. Like, like everywhere I turn around, we're in competition with somebody. You go to school, you're in competition. You know, you walk down the street, you're in competition. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not against competition, but I feel like when you're in competition for everything, I don't really know if that necessarily is a good thing. And maybe that's the reason why some of these conditions that you talk about are, are manifesting itself is because I have to somehow prove that I'm better than you in everything. So this is how I'm going to do it. If I can't do this legitimately, I'm going to do this illegitimately by talking about you or attacking you or abusing you or whatever. So I don't know. I'm just thinking about that. Go ahead, Jace. 
Yeah, I was, um, <laughs> you know, I was kind of kind of respond to SB and also going back to Sean's original question, and I can I can get off on a tangent on this subject matter as Sean knows, but I won't. I'll try to keep it brief, but you know, I sadly and it just in my view, and I read a lot, and I I think I'm pretty connected to a lot of different circles. Um, I, I think ta the toxic masculinity which I think creates this subculture of bullying is still very much alive and well. And um, from a political standpoint, you know, again, this is where I get really, really uneasy because we have some terrible, terrible leadership and terrible, terrible models out there. And you're probably all knowing exactly who one 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 person who I may be referencing as as a former president, but it didn't start with him. So I can't blame it all on him. Okay. But he certainly exacerbated the problem. But I'm just going to share with you that I I have a lot of anxiety about where we are at. Um I live in a fairly and again this is not I'm not I'm I'm not I'm going to try to be, you know, objective, you know, it, this isn't limited to just one side of the political aisle. I do happen to believe it's on one side more than the other, but I live in a, in a, in a, in a pretty conservative town uh, in Colorado. And, and this is all anecdotal, obviously, but just the things I see, the things I hear, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of resentment. And, um, you know, again, who am I to judge to say that they're not entitled to feel anger and resentment? But I think that type of belief when you're that angry and, and you have, you know, these nasty sounding bumper stickers and these nasty sounding shirts and all these things that kind of just want to, sh you know, things that just, you know, so many examples of, of what I see mostly men trying to show how tough they are, how mainly they are. I saw a dude today at my son's baseball camp. Who had this? I mean, I mean, in light of what's been going on the last few weeks, this, this massive tattoo on his left arm of of an AK-47, and I'm just like, does that make you tough? Does that make you? Why why do you have that? You know, why why is there this? There's this need to show how tough we are, whether it be in a tattoo, a bumper sticker, a shirt that says "fuck Joe Biden," or, or you know. Just and 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 then you see the behavior of that person, uh, man. It, it gets manifested on people around him. I mean, there was there was a, a a group of parents, a small group of parents who were, and I don't know. I'm again, I'm not trying to be critical of just one side of the political aisles. I don't know what <laughs> who these people were, but just some people that got super nasty and mean with my my kid's twelve year old umpire for his baseball game. He's an umpire for a 12 year old baseball game. And he may, maybe he made a bad call on a strike. They're, they're, they're getting angry at him and, and yelling at him. They didn't call him names, but, and there's this, and by the way, there's a sign right there on the baseball field that says, do not coach your players from the stands. Do not criticize the umps. So as that sign is sitting there staring everybody in the crowd, these guys are yelling at this probably 14 year old ump. Yeah. Cause he'd made a bad call on a ball or a strike. Anyway. So again, these are all anecdotal examples but i think again being tied into the larger political conversation because i'm pretty in tune with that i am not feeling good about where we are at as a society our levels of empathy seem to be again just in my view going down um you know the word compromise the word collaboration is is taboo if you're a politician you know and again we're we're we're, we're even seeing it with, this, with, with the gun uh, reform, the potential gun reform. I mean, you know, everyone's going in the wake of 19 more kids being killed and two adults at this at Uvalde. Everybody's going to their circles. Everyone's shooting arrows at the other side. It's just it's the same shit, and I think it's getting worse. And you know, is it all toxic masculinity that's driving this? No, it's not. But. There's a it's it, there's a lot of it there. There's a lot of this. I have to prove type of mentality that I see and it's very disturbing. So I want to I want to ask Jenny both on Jason's comments and and Andre talking about competition. Since you put on competitions, um do you have you know any comments on what either one of them had to say? 
Well, I mean, obviously that, that kind of stuff goes on all the time. I mean, you have volunteers who are putting themselves out there and we have, you know, we have all these mechanisms in place for settling disputes. We have calm rooms for arbitration. I mean, there's a lot of tools and mechanisms to, to, to send a dispute, to go into a room, to talk to a panel. Um, and, and all those supports that we put in place and all the, the pre-reads and all the learning that we put into place, it still doesn't trump, to use a bad word, emotion in the moment. So I think when emotion in the moment uh, clouds our judgment and we don't have tools at the ready that we've learned through a school counselor, which there aren't enough of, through therapy uh, outlets, which there aren't enough of, through mental health centers in schools, which are literally being actively you know, pushed out of schools because people think it's indoctrination these days. I mean, there's, there's so much learning that needs to be done that isn't being done that I feel like we're almost trapped in a little bit of a, a cycle. Like, you know, Jason was saying, almost we're self-perpetuating our own downward spiral, but I, like, I refuse to, to go down the drain with it. And I feel like even in our tiny corners of the world, you know, in, in your classroom or, you know, in the circles that you're talking to or whatever circle of influence you have where you can apply a best practice and try to teach people some methodology for spiraling up instead of spiraling down, I think that's like the best we can do. So I, I try to remain, I try to remain hopeful and I try to channel, um, you know, my own frustration into action that I think is positive towards moving to a place of change and also continuously opening myself up to things where I learn and I can be educated so that I can share that education out. Yeah, let's let's talk about a little bit more of that because at the end of um, at the end of Christine Porras book on mastering civility, the last question is, who do you want to be and at the end of the book? And so, I mean, it just was like, okay, that's a perfect, perfect ending, but, but other, and there's a lot in it that's really good, but you know, some of the things that stuck with me, I'm like, okay, Christine, you're talking to these business people and in, in here you have as fundamentals, say please and thank you, smile, you know, listen. I mean, these are things, you know, I'm like, how did that go? Because while to me, I think it, they're wonderful things, um, very simple things. That again, Jason, when you talk about go to your go to your corner and start slinging arrows, are you going to be smiling while you do it because you're you're happy that you know you're hurting someone, <laughs> or can we be more civil in how we engage people? Yes, SB. See, I feel like Sean, I, I, this the, an old Shakespeare quote is coming up to me as you're talking about civility and this idea of like niceties and all the things that are on the surface. A man can smile and smile and be a villain. <laughs> and I believe it to be true. I don't think that I, I think when we're talking about a level as deep as bullying, which which speaks to abuse, we're talking about something that is um, a relationship based problem that has a relationship based answer that goes a lot deeper than niceties. Uh, like please and thank you. And so I think that I think it's important to paint a picture of like what does it require to have a culture where bullying is not acceptable? Because I think that uh, Jenny painted a great picture of um, that uh, that moment where you know we become the not the thinking beings that feel, but the feeling beings that think. And it all comes down to self-management. And if we don't have very good self-management, then it comes down to the social container that we're in. And we will we will engage with others in the way that uh, the the immediate culture around us allows us to engage. And so it is about setting expectations. You talked about, you know, pre-reading and whatnot. Um, it's about creating shared agreements and coming back to them often um, and really making them explicit about what it looks, sounds, and feels like to belong in this community, whether that community is a business or a classroom or a family. Um, and it means doing the brave work of calling on ourselves and others when we transgress those shared agreements. 
and 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 we can call one another in instead of calling one another out um, and really hold ourselves um, to account for the way that we want to be, not I want to be. It's a collective enterprise, this business of building a culture of belonging. It's not about how one person shows up. It's about how the collective agrees to show up, I think. And I agree with you. And 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 each person comes into the collective, right? And I think that you said that. How do I come into the collective? Who do I want to be when I'm in community? And and I get the fact that please and thank yous and smiles may be niceties. But I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure you've seen people where just a kind word and reaching out to them when they're struggling um, goes a long way. And I think that's what I'm trying to get to is if we um, go through our day only as one person, can I begin to engage someone in a better way than, other, than they may be engaged? And does that help just even a little bit more? Maybe it's too simple. I'm all for the one-on-one -on -one relationship building. I think it has great value. I built my life on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also am sensitive to the fact that uh, this conversation on civility has been whitewashed and is very has a, has a very clear cultural valence. And what looks civil to one person can feel fake to another person, depending on their culture and their background. And different people need different ways of relationship building. So I think it behooves us if we really care about building relationships uh, that are more than than uh, than the shallow, um, that we ask people what they need and what and what kindness and respect looks like to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can say that as a former classroom teacher, um, I had a lot of students who challenged me on respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, look me in the eye if you respect me. That's not how I was brought up. That's incredibly disrespectful. It's like such a small mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and And so I think, um, to be a truly civil society, we might need to work a little bit harder than well, the pleases. Can I just, I just want to add something to that as well. And we haven't, I haven't heard this word tonight. And it, as, as SB was talking, it, it started coming up for me. You know, we talked about what, what typically drives a bully. It's a bully who has their own personal issues and, and that they're dealing with. Um, the sense of belongingness, but we also, you know, what I see, and again, I think society has made without, I don't want to be super negative, you know, there have been tremendous progress we've made as society in, in a lot of different areas, okay, but the thing that I see still where, where bullying used to occur back in the day, and, and it still does now, is, is a, a lack of tolerance, you know, again, like, it, it, the people being bullied are usually the ones who are different, different sexual orientation, different race, different belief system, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that's where, you know, whether it was, you know, 50 years ago or today, to, there's still that the, from what I see going on. There's, there's still, you know, we talk about kindness, I agree, and, and but there also, and, and empathy, and but there has to be tolerance as well. We, I, st I still think we all, and I'm not excluding myself from this group, have to do a, a better job tolerating people or groups of people who are different and respect that and understand that doesn't mean we necessarily have to agree with it okay but i i think that's where still a lot of the bullying is derived from people that look different people that think different you know and i and i think that's and i, I think that's sad i really do but I, I think that's still a big a big a big problem for us and, and jason if i could interject on what you just said i'm trying to think because again, I'm in the school and, and I've gone through school. And I'm trying to think of a time where in my education, in my formal education in school, where we focus on what you talked about. Like when have I ever sat down in school to, for example, learn how to deal with conflict? When have I ever sat down in school and really not just talked about the differences of people on an academic level and through history, but really get down to the nitty gritty of the different styles and cultures of other individual people and stuff and, and things of that nature. I mean, again, I get a lot of facts from school, 
but I didn't get a lot of that, that personal social training. Most of it I got from my parents and thank God they had their head screwed on straight because if they didn't, who knows where I would be right now. But school, I didn't learn it from. And so I'm asking myself the question, well, I spent 12 fucking years in school. What did I get out of that? And, and the information I did get, why did I get that information and not this information? What was the motivation of giving me this information versus that information? And I think if we can answer that question, then we can answer some of the questions on, well, why do we have bullies? Why, why can't we problem solve the gun control issue? Why are we fighting each other like this politically and this and that? You know, I think we can answer some of those questions if we can if we can talk about some of the training institutions that we put ourselves in, you know, I have I have an opinion and thoughts about that, as Sean knows. But I mean, I think we have to ask ourselves those questions. So I, I am fortunate in that I get to be in schools where this type of education is happening and where organizations are having these vibrant conversations. And the buzz line there, uh, you might be interested to hear, Jason, is beyond tolerance. Because tolerance, I mean, is that really the best we can do? We can tolerate you. Uh, but then who is doing the tolerating? Again, that creates this power dynamic where people are othered based on their relationship to power because of their social identity. And so um, I, I, as, as, uh, as a Jew, as a family of survivors, um, I, I know that, that toleration is, um, uh, is not <laughs> a, a, a deep enough um, understanding of, uh, of others and, and, um, and it, it's too thin a threshold. Um, to be able to be a protective factor against some of the violence um, and um, against some of the violence and and divisiveness that you're describing. And what an and uneven so I, distribution of, of of resources we have in our country that in places where you might be working, um, there may be a great uh, support for social emotional learning for you know behavioral modification for mental health and there's other places where they are actively trying to root that out of schools yep. because it's become politicized so even now mental health is being politicized so if it's not a book that you're reading or you know don't say gay it, it's just a constant war of control of who gets to tell you how to think and really that is part of the problem because everyone thinks differently but i think we all have some societal goals around you know what what it means to be a a good and moral person and just follow some basic laws that we all would like to follow so that we can have a nice day i mean there's some very basic shit it shouldn't be so hard and i would would love to speak to some of these anti groups about just the simplicity strip away all your terms, strip away your CRT and your SEL, and just get down to basics about discipline, self-control, and maybe just like some diversionary tactics to maybe do some counting, take a couple breaths. I mean, everybody knows how to take three steps, simple things. I mean, there's just so much simplicity, but people are so wrapped up now, I think in going to their corners and you know they have an agenda and it just kind of wrecks things. And our kids are the ones who are caught in the middle of all the adult conversations fighting over who's right, who's wrong, who gets to be elected and who gets to tell you what to do. And I mean, and we all know what's happening with our youth right now, mental health crisis skyrocketing, just absolutely skyrocketing. And yet the very organizations that protect, you know, mental health for youth, even the ability to to collect statistics is being fought. I just saw today, the state of Florida isn't allowing the CDC to collect youth data on health, on mental health, on suicide prevention, on, on obesity, just simple basic things. The state said, you can't talk to our kids anymore. So we can't even collect data on kids' mental health and wellness and anxiety because the adults are fighting again. So, I mean, just, I think we just, uh, we need like a national therapy session that isn't called therapy so that it won't be politicized and just <laughs> get back to basics. 
just be a good goddamn person. Hey, um, yeah, I know I, I agree with everything you said, but SB, would you mind expand? I, I appreciate you telling me that about this beyond tolerance. So could you, could you just articulate on that a little bit more just for, cause I want to understand that more. I think it sounds great, but. Um, I would, I would just put out there since I, I, I know we're, uh, we might be running out of daylight that facing history in ourselves has some really, really awesome resources. Um, and they might be politicized <laughs> and I don't care. Um, and I, basically if you think about the idea of, um, uh, of toleration, I think you have your answer there is that is that the way that we want to live in community is that the best that we can do and when it really hits the fan if we have uh merely been practicing on tolerating others and smiling and you know moving on dot com and you know having a, having a pleasant white day um when it really hits the fan and when we really need to help one another um is that quality and that depth of relationship going to get us where we need to go? Yeah. So in other words, tolerance is, is too low of a bar for what we're really trying to achieve. I think so. Yeah. It makes sense. I think we really need to know each other. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's hard. And we can't know that many people. So we need to be selective about our people. Um, but if we can, have ways of being and doing that center the holistic self in small groups i think we can get better as a society we can we can become more well um like you know jenny you said you serve a quarter million children at a time i'm assuming they're not all in the room together but they have small hubs in these small groups um where they can more deeply um come to understand what they care about, what makes them tick, what they're passionate about. This is a level of depth that really binds people together in qualitative ways. What's it like 120? Like you can really know about 120 people and then kind of expand. Is it 150? 150 yeah, and then it kind of closes Dunbar in. Says 150, yeah. Yeah. Thanks and much, and the yeah, and the people, yeah, and the people in that outer circle are just like associates and then it kind of gets more intimate as you get closer into the circle. Right into the bulls. Anything else. Yeah. yeah. Well, as a counselor, I have 350. So um, good luck with that. <laughs> right. So uh, so let's wrap it up. Let's just go around the horn. Um, you know, any any closing thoughts you have about the subject? Anything you hope that uh, folks that are listening listening to this ask themselves about the big question or do um, about the big question? And anyone can go. I'll put my bumper sticker back out there. Her people, her people. Bullying is about power more than anything else. And it's also about what the culture will tolerate from human behavior. And we know how to do better. We need to step up and do the thing. And that is coming together in good ways, circling up, talking about how we agree to show up with and for each other, and then calling each other on it when we don't live up to our ex collective expectations. These are the things that we need to do. Thanks, SB. I'd say work on providing safe spaces for people where they can have a bully-free zone or at least creating creating spaces where people can be themselves and then you know provide the training and support for people who are um, in leadership positions around them. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I, um, I hate cliches. I hate, hate, hate cliches. And um, one of the cliches that I think many of us live by, um, and I see it again in the political realm a lot, used is is you got to fight fire with fire, and um, hmm. I couldn't. I mean, yes, of course you have to stand. You know, again, that can be interpreted in, in a thousand different directions. Okay, but I'm saying in the in the context of as as we've all kind of talked today, you know, in, in various ways. You know, we have to find a way to de-escalate the tension, and 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 you know, when, yeah. So so, you know, my I guess my message is, you know, how do we de-escalate tension? How do we de-escalate mm -hmm. hatred? How would how do we de-escalate 
meanness? You know, how do we, how can we all as individuals contribute to this de-escalation? Um, because I think if collectively our society can have a de-escalation, I think then conversation and dialogue can begin again. And I think we're at a point right now, sadly, where that can't happen. Yes, we're having a dialogue amongst the five of us, but I'm talking just generally speaking, there doesn't seem to be much movement in any direction one way or the other in solving these problems. Um, so I guess the only way, what, the only thing we can do or the only thing I can do, speaking for myself, is again, just keep trying to de-escalate. You know, when I get fired up and I get fired up pretty easily with things, instead of going <laughs> after somebody and questioning their values and their beliefs or criticizing them or name calling them or belittling them, which is all within me, mm -hmm. to de-escalate it. Mm -hmm. just, hey, okay. <laughs> How can we come to some common ground here? Some common ground. So that's it. Thanks, Jason. Andre? Yeah. I, I'm under the I'm I, I used to was unsure about this, but I'm under the opinion now that um it's a it's almost it's 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 impossible to love other people until you love yourself. So um you have to start there first. There's no going around it, there's no building your community first and then loving yourself. It just doesn't work that way. I've tried it. It doesn't work. You have to love yourself. You have to work on yourself. You have to build your character. You you, you have to do that. Uh, it's, a, it's an inward, outward thing. And so if, if, any, if anybody pays attention to anything that I'm trying to do and model is, is that I'm not really trying to preach to anybody anymore, even though you guys know how much I love to talk um i'm really just trying to try, trying to model what it is that i want to see out there with the hopes that somebody will look at that and say hey that's working for andre maybe that'll work for me and i'm hoping that if i'm able to take care of myself appropriately and effectively and consistently that i will be able to influence my community my world my family mm. to follow the following those same footsteps uh and so just like jenny i i have i'm I'm very hopeful and optimistic that um, we'll be able to figure this out, but there's, there might be some casualties along the way. And I think that that's just the way life goes and we're not gonna be here forever. None of us are gonna be here forever and that's just the way it is. And I, I'm hoping that while I, I do have an opportunity to be here on this planet, that I can do the best I can while I'm here, regardless of if it's tomorrow or 80 years from now, so. Thanks, Andre. Thanks to you all. Much appreciated. Thanks, um, thanks for all the great thoughts. And uh, we'll see you again next month. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank thanks, you. Jenny. Yeah. Great Have a good night, everyone. Peace. Good night.